So last week, Wednesday the 10th of April 2019 was a big day. The Event Horizon Telescope that's been taking data for a couple of years now finally released their long-awaited image of a black hole. And so the dust has had a little bit of time to settle after a bit of a manic week and so I thought it would be a really great time now to reflect on the reasons why we actually care about this, why it's not just a pretty picture. So first up, this is the very first image of the sphere of influence of a black hole, the event horizon that we've ever been able to achieve. It sort of confirms our theories of what was actually in the centre of galaxies, powering the extreme radiation we saw coming from the centre. So back in the 60s, for those who remember my story of supermassive black holes video, I'll link it up in a card and down below in the comments, you remember that people were seeing x-ray emission and radio emission from the centres of galaxies and they couldn't explain what that was coming from because black holes were still theoretical objects. But then when sort of Stephen Hawking came along and said, well, actually black holes are sort of a natural byproduct of the mathematics that you have in general relativity. And then also Jocelyn Bell Bunnell and her team discovered uh, neutron stars were real and therefore neutron stars are sort of the one step up from something becoming a black hole. Then people started to think, well, maybe you can get this super high radiation coming from the centers of galaxies if you have accretion onto a super dense object in the center. And you might be wondering, well, how on earth can they take an image of a black hole? Because by definition, a black hole is something that is so dense and so massive in such a small space that its escape velocity is, is greater than the speed of light. So you don't get, you know, any light from this black hole, so you can't see it. But what they've done here is actually take an image of the material directly around the black hole. So we're talking about the scale of this image is only a couple of solar system sizes across that they've managed to take. And so they're taking the actual material that's currently spiraling around the black hole in what we call an accretion disk. So accretion is a word that we use a lot in astrophysics. It basically means like collected under gravity. And so this disk is this material that is eventually going to be accreted or eaten by the black hole. And so what happens is that that material is moving at such high, high speeds, like close to the speed of light, that it heats up due to friction and it emits light that way. And then that's the light we can then see and take an image of. Of course, the black hole is also in the middle of that disk of material as well. So if it's slightly inclined to you, and also this disk is sort of rotating as well as it spirals in towards the black hole, then some of it's coming towards you and some of it is moving away from you. But then also the light that's coming from behind this three-dimensional you know, mass of the black hole there is gonna be absorbed as well. So you end up sort of with a bright patch of this disk and then a darker patch. And then also the light in the middle where you've passed what we call the event horizon. So the event horizon is the sort of point of no return around a black hole, that if you pass that point, then nothing is going to be able to get back out of the black hole again, because that's the point at which you need a speed higher than the speed of light in order to escape the gravitational pull of it. So you end up casting what people have been calling a shadow of the black hole. There's been some debate about whether it's a shadow or whether it's a silhouette. But essentially, you end up seeing this circle in the middle of this accretion disk where there is no light coming towards you. And so our predictions for what we might expect to see if there was a black hole there have actually turned out to be true as well. So the second reason why we care about this image is because we can actually use it to test our theories of gravity. So Newton came up with a theory of gravity back sort of 500 years ago and he said it was this sort of mysterious force at a distance where objects feel a force proportional to how massive they are. Einstein came along and said actually let's think about gravity as curving space. So anything with mass sits on space itself and curves it so that anything traveling on that curved space their path gets bent. So a light would continue traveling on a straight line unless it got bent by curved space. And the reason that Einstein came up with this new way of thinking about it was also because Newton's gravity, although Newton's equations of gravity explained what we saw on Earth really quite well, they didn't really predict what we were seeing on larger scales, even in the solar system itself. So Mercury's orbit, Newtonian gravity couldn't explain Mercury's orbit. And for a while we thought it was to do with the observations that we were making errors, but in fact it was just our equations were missing a term. They were missing this term that at higher speeds, something else is happening. So Einstein's theories of gravity actually adapted Newton's equations to say there's this extra term when you're at higher speeds or at higher masses, something called we call relativistic energies. And so 
We've tested that against the orbit of Mercury and Einstein's equations work. We've tested it in terms of the orbits of stars in galaxies and Einstein's equations work. What we've never been able to do is test Einstein's equations and Einstein's theory of gravity so close to a black hole before, where you have pushed to the most extreme relativistic energies, the highest speeds and the highest masses you can get to as well. And so with this image, they were able to say, okay, given that Einstein said that black holes and objects in space will curve space-time, has it done that to the light around it? And that's why we end up actually seeing this sort of brighter side of the accretion disk. Yes, one is the fact that it's been absorbed by the black hole behind it, but also the light has been bent around the black hole and then beamed towards us because of the gravitational effects of the presence of the black hole as well. And we've been able to say, yes, the material spanning around that black hole fully fits Einstein's theories of gravity and it was right again. And there were some people that were kind of disappointed that there wasn't any new physics or new ideas about gravity that came out of that. It was not that they were disappointed that Einstein was right, but they were almost disappointed that there was nothing new to learn. It was almost kind of a surprise that our theories fit what we saw again. That yes, we should take Einstein's theory of gravity at all masses, at all speeds, anywhere in the universe it should hold. So the third thing that we care about is that we can now test how black holes grow. So the material in that accretion disk will eventually uh, fall into the black hole and basically add to its mass and help it grow in mass. And so what it can help us understand is how black holes have grown from the very early universe, from say 10 times the mass of the sun after some stars gone supernova in the early universe, or maybe even 10,000 times the mass of the sun, if you've had direct collapse of some massive gas cloud. Check out my other video on direct collapse black holes if you want to know more about that. But how it's gone from that in the early universe to what we see now at something like a million to a billion times the mass of the sun, you know, how has that growth happened in those 13 billion years? Has it been constant or has it been variable? Has it been stochastic in some way? And so our best understanding now of how black holes grow is that we think they're quite variable, it's quite stochastic growth, where you have some inflow of material, of gas from the galaxy itself towards the center. The black hole accretes all it can quite quickly and then you have to wait for sort of the next inflow of gas. It's not a constant thing. The black hole quite quickly clears the area around it. But what we've seen with M87 is that the accretion seems to be quite constant. Over about a week or so's observations, the accretion disk image didn't change that much at all. So at least we know it's not variable on those kind of a time scale. But with further observations in the future, maybe we will see more variability. Now the fourth reason why we care is the reason I care the most. And that's because there's this small scale that we're looking at here is so very connected to the large scale. Now, if you've seen an image of M87 before, you will see that it's this sort of yellowish blob of a galaxy, but that actually there's also this huge energetic jet, that sort of this purplish color, bluish purplish color, that's coming all the way out of the galaxy for hundreds of thousands of light years. And that jet is thought to be powered by the black hole. So it's not just general relativity we're testing, with this image. We're also testing something that's called general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics, which basically means how gravity and the magnetic field around the black hole are interacting so that all that plasma, the material that's in the accretion desk, basically incredibly, incredibly hot material that's been ionized so its electrons are separate from the protons and neutrons in the atoms, is interacting with the magnetic field. And so you've got charged particles around this black hole that's also spinning as well. And so as it spins, the magnetic field lines around that black hole get incredibly, incredibly tangled because it's spinning so fast. Then you've got charged particles that are then gonna follow those magnetic field lines. And essentially what we think happens is they get accelerated away from the accretion disk into these huge jets that get ejected, you know, at very close to the speed of light. And so manage to come out of the galaxy in this huge scale. And so what impact we think these jets have is to impact on the material between galaxies. And so what that can do is then heat all of that material. And that's the material that's basically gonna feed your galaxies fresh gas supply that it can funnel to the black hole or it can make stars with. And so by getting this data of the accretion disk around the black hole, we can also test our general relativistic magneto hydrodynamic simulations of what's going on when all these magnetic field lines get all intercrossed over and messed up and then all the particles get accelerated outwards to check if that's actually what's happening here as well and get an understanding for how the very, very small scale around the black hole 
has a much larger impact on the galaxy and even the cluster of galaxies that it lives in. The fifth and final reason why this image is so momentous to astrophysicists is that it is a proof of concept. The image was taken by using radio telescopes that were dotted across Earth to make one single radio telescope. Now the reason for this is that the resolution or the, the size of the thing that you can resolve clearly is dependent on how big your telescope is. So we call our resolution a Greek letter theta and it's proportional to the wavelength of light that you're looking in divided by the diameter of the telescope that you have. Now building a telescope with a diameter big enough to resolve something that is about three times the size of the solar system at a distance of 55 million light years is just not feasible at all. What you find when you do that calculation is that you need a telescope that's as big as the Earth. What astronomers quickly figured out though was that you didn't need to build a telescope that big. Instead, if you could take a telescope, say, in Antarctica and combine it with a telescope, say, in Hawaii and observe the same object at the same time, you would have effectively made a telescope that has a diameter of the distance separating Antarctica and Hawaii. The problem is that you weren't sampling that entire space. You didn't have detectors fully across that entire distance. But what you could do is basically wait for the Earth to rotate and therefore you would sort of fill in the gaps. So you did have detectors in those places. And the more telescopes you add, the less gaps you would have. The thing is though, even with the Earth's rotation, you don't end up filling in all of the gaps. And so what they also had to do was develop a new computer algorithm to basically infer the data where there was gaps and what should be expected given what data you do have. So the person that actually led this was a graduate student at MIT called Katie Booman, who's now an assistant professor at Caltech, which is awesome. And she came up with this new computer algorithm that basically said, given the data that I have and given all the other images that have been taken in the world, whether they're selfies or birds or they are actually of astronomical images or maybe they're simulations of what we should be seeing, what kind of image do we reproduce if we use that as a training set for what the image could eventually look like? And basically they were able to show that no matter what training set you use, whether it is the selfies or whether it is normal astronomical images taken of say nebula or galaxies, you end up reconstructing images that look incredibly similar of what you should expect to see of this accretion disk. She gives an amazing TED talk on this. And I, again, I will link that down below for you guys to go watch if you wanna know more information about this amazing computer algorithm. But because you've had proof of concept this actually works, that you can resolve it using just eight telescopes and having this computer algorithm, it means that people will be more likely to jump on board with studies like this. It means that we'll get more telescopes added to the array, so you won't be just doing it with eight, you'll be doing it with say 20. And maybe even we'll be able to extend the size of our telescope beyond the, the size of the Earth, maybe by putting a radio telescope into space, into orbit around Earth, or perhaps uh, in a trailing orbit, sort of following the Earth around the sun, maybe even on the moon. So then the effective diameter of your telescope is the distance between the Earth and the moon, which means that the object that you can resolve would be even tinier. We could see these things at even greater distance or even in more detail as well, which would be incredible. We could eventually reach a point where releasing an image of a black hole is just becomes the norm. Maybe even like a data dump of a hundred at once will feel completely normal, just, you know, like a regular Tuesday. <laughs> That's the dream. But what are the next steps for the Event Horizon Telescope now that it's done this first image of the supermassive black hole in M87? Well, admittedly, I think most astronomers last Wednesday were not expecting this image to be of M87. They were expecting it to be of what we call Sagittarius A star, which is the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And when it wasn't, people were like, huh, Okay, all right, we'll run with it. We'll go with M87. And so people have been speculating a little bit on why maybe they released M87 before they released the Milky Way's uh, image of a black hole. And one of those reasons could be inclination. So the fact that the accretion disk around the Milky Way's black hole might be inclined so that we don't actually see it from a very optimum sort of direction and that's sort of affecting the image reduction. Another reason just could because there's just so much foreground. So basically there's so many stars and dust and gas in the way of you seeing the black hole in the Milky Way compared to when you look out of the Milky Way's disk up to M87, 
that it's sort of wondering, you know, what is actually noise, what's real data, what's foreground that you can get rid of, and subtracting those foregrounds is very, very difficult as well. And it could also be due to the variability of the Milky Way's accretion disk as well. Perhaps it's not as constant accretion as M87s, and so they're not sure what sort of signal they're getting. It's not consistent either. Also, they want to add a different wavelength to the array as well. So far, all these have been images have been taken in what's called the submillimeter, sort of between infrared and radio regimes on the electromagnetic spectrum, about 1.3 millimeter in wavelength. They're now going to drop to 0.87 millimeters in wavelength by adding some new telescopes to the array as well. And so that's going to improve their resolution more because you've dropped your wavelength, so your resolution will increase. So I'm really excited to see whether we get an image of the Milky Way's black hole next, or whether it's a higher resolution of M87, or whether it's a, an image that shows us that it's been variable in its accretion somehow, and just how much more physics we'll be able to learn from observing black holes like this in this whole new way. Love filming on a Sunday, it's given me an excuse not to watch the Masters this year of a gas cloud, check out my other video on direct collapse black holes, you might be interested in that. Stupid phone, how dare you buzz at me while I am. Snapchat, Ugh, god I really need a haircut. Ugh. Gonna observe my black hole till I can't no more. Gonna take data till there's no more light. And the fifth and final reason why we really care about this image is because... <laughs> my sister texted me and was like, yeah, I've seen the image, it's like a funny orange blob. And I'm like, yeah, but it's an orange blob with a hole in the middle. I know some of you wanted this video last week, but there was no way that I could have gone from two o'clock announcement to like edit and then posting later in the day because I did radio and I did telly as well. I was on the evening news talking about this stuff. So Wednesdays is video day and if stuff like this falls on a Wednesday again, we just have to be patient and wait until next Wednesday.